I'd like to start um, with introducing myself. I'm Candy Welch, and, and I'd like to thank all of you for making the effort to be here this morning. I know how difficult it can be to get up and get out, especially for you patients who are struggling with MSA. My husband, Bob, was diagnosed with probable MSA in 2002 at Vanderbilt University, and he passed away from his complications in 2008. Before he died, he generously agreed to donate his brain for research upon his death. His MSA diagnosis was confirmed at that time. He was only 57 years old. I wish we'd had a resource like this symposium when we were dealing with his illness, and I hope when leaving here today, you'll all feel like your time here has been well spent. I found Robin Riddle through the internet in 2006 and started attending the support group she founded for caregivers whose loved ones were suffering from the four atypical Parkinson's diseases that are represented here today. I stayed on to help with the meetings after Bob died and have been involved with the, her creation of the nonprofit organization, BSN, or Brain Support Network, which will assist patients who want to help with research through brain donation and will offer help, offer support and education for caregivers. Now I want to introduce our speaker, Dr. Kathleen Poston. Dr. Poston is on the Stanford Movement Disorder team and has clinical expertise and research experience in MSA and Parkinson's diseases. I've heard many great things about Dr. Poston and her practice. She comes highly recommended by some of our support group members for her caring nature and her knowledge of MSA. Please help us in welcoming Dr. Poston. Thank you, and thank you all for coming today. Um, I, I do appreciate everyone coming out on a Saturday morning and, and realize that on, on a lovely day like today, you probably have some better places to be. But, um, but hopefully we can make this as, as informative and interactive as possible. Um, and, and please do sort of think of questions because we'll be doing a, a question and answer session at the end, okay? So um, let me just uh, say a couple of words about what got me actually initially interested in in MSA, as, as uh, Kenny mentioned, uh, my background is I'm a, uh, trained in general neurology at UCSF, and then I went to Columbia to do a special movement disorders fellowship, which is a focus on uh, diseases like Parkinson's disease and atypical Parkinsonian syndromes. And it was during my time at Columbia that I had a couple very special patients who, uh, who I diagnosed with MSA who um, really left quite an impression on me during that time and and uh, prompted my the research efforts that I that I currently do in trying to come up with better techniques to diagnose patients with MSA as, as you all know that's a big challenge and we'll talk about that in just a moment um, as well as trying to understand the um, underlying problems in MSA and come up with more um, disease specific treatments right now as, as you're going to see we really borrow most of what we do for MSA from other treatments that are available, and, and we desperately need some disease-specific treatments for MSA. So that's sort of where my background comes from, and I do see um, a lot of uh, Parkinson's disease patients in my in my clinic at Stanford, but I also try to uh, see as many um, atypical Parkinsonian patients as possible, and specifically MSA during my practice. So what I want to start off with is just some good old terminology, because I often hear from my husband that I sometimes use words that are not real words, is, is how he puts it. Um, that that's not a real word, Kathleen. You, you, you can't use that word. And, and this is true of all doctors. We sort of spend four years of medical school literally learning a new language and a new way of communicating with one another. And that new language um, is, is great when doctors talk to each other because we use very shortened phrases to communicate a lot of information and it facilitates information. But then it turns out not everyone has gone to medical school and has learned that language. And it's very hard to sometimes translate all of that into what patients hear. And I think MSA is particularly challenging with this because there's been changes in terminology over the years. So I just want to go over that for a moment because a lot of you have probably heard these different words and it turns out they mean very specific things to your doctors. Um, so first off, Parkinsonism. So that's just a clinical syndrome that um, basically means a person who has some slowness, which we call bradykinesia, has some rigidity, which basically just means stiff muscles, possibly tremor, and then gait and balance problems. And someone who has that constellation, and actually you just need two of those three things, is termed clinical Parkinsonism. And it turns out 
this is the list of things that I tell my residents can cause Parkinsonism. So this is just for your reference. There's actually more to this list, but these are all the different things that can cause Parkinsonism. So it's a long list of things. I like to break them down into four different categories. One of them is there are some genetic diseases that can include Parkinsonism. There is classic Parkinson's disease. There's what we call secondary causes, so infections, um, tumors, uh, strokes, things like that. And then there's this category of other neurodegenerative syndromes, and that's really where MSA lives. And that's also where the other syndromes that Dr. Litvan spoke about earlier today also live. Um, PSP, uh, CBD, and dementia with Lewy bodies. So this is sort of the category that it comes under. So let me just go into a few more little terminology. So there's a lot of other names out there that I'm sure all of you have heard for MSA. So there are broader names, things like atypical Parkinsonism, which is the um, over the theme of our of our uh, symposium today. Other people say atypical Parkinsonian syndrome. People have also used the term Parkinson's plus syndrome. These all mean it's Parkinsonism, but not Parkinson's disease. That's basically what that means. And so when I get a referral from a doctor and it basically says, patient with an atypical Parkinsonian syndrome, you know, please evaluate. Basically what they're saying to me is, this person has Parkinsonism. I believe it's a neurodegenerative cause of Parkinsonism, not a genetic or secondary cause. I don't think it's Parkinson's disease but I don't know exactly what it is. I don't know if it's MSA. I don't know if it's PSP. I don't know if it's CBD. So when doctors broadly use that term atypical Parkinsonism, it's usually because they're not confident that it's specifically something like MSA or PSP. It's a broad catch term that we use that means not typical Parkinson's disease, but I'm not 100% sure I can narrow it anymore. Okay, so that's, that's what that term means. Now, there are these older names for MSA that some of you have also heard, things like shy drager syndrome, striatonigral degeneration, and spontaneous alvopontocerebellar atrophy. That last one's a bit of a mouthful. Um, these are syndromic terms that were described many, many years ago when um, doctors would see patients, and this top one, they'd see patients with a lot of blood pressure problems, and this middle one, these were patients who looked very Parkinsonian but didn't get a great response to medications. And this bottom part were patients who had a lot of, um, a lot of coordination problems. And it turns out that in 1989, this Dr. Pape and colleagues, um, through the very generous donation of a lot of patients who had, who had died and had donated their brains to research, he looked at all these brains of patients who had these three different syndromes and realized the underlying pathology was identical. And he's the one who pulled it together and said, let's stop calling these things different diseases. Let's call them one disease and let's call it multiple system atrophy. And the reason why that name was chosen because it meant multiple brain systems. Okay, so the system of the brain that controls the autonomic nervous system, which I'll explain a little more of in a moment, the part of the brain that involves coordination, which is the cerebellum, and the part of the brain that controls speed of motion, um, which is the Parkinsonism part. And so that's where the name came from. So really, honestly, it was only in 89 that um, doctors even had a clue that these diseases were actually had the same underlying pathology. And this is really what pushed um, our understanding of MSA forward. So just uh, one more slide of, or two more slides of science for those of you who are interested. Um, it was a couple years later, people realized that, um, that this pathologic finding that Dr. Pape had discovered um, were basically these little blobs here. Um, and these little blobs are basically protein clusters of the protein alpha-synuclein. And that protein cluster, alpha-synuclein, is the same protein cluster that's actually found in both Parkinson's disease and dementia with Lewy bodies. And that's why these three diseases are often termed together by scientists as synucleinopathies because they have the same protein cluster that's underlying the pathology, which means they're probably related somehow, but we don't exactly understand how. Um, scientists don't know whether these protein clusters are protective or if they're the problem. That's a big debate. Maybe these proteins are clustering in a way to try to protect the nerve cells. Maybe the proteins clustering are the underlying problem. It's, it's, it's honestly um, quite debated um, in the scientific literature what exactly the, the role of these protein clusters are. But nonetheless, these are where the term um, synucleinopathy comes from, is from these, these little blobs that happen here.
And the way we diagnose this on a pathology um, when someone dies and, and donates their brain is that we look at certain regions of the brain. And this right here is the region where we see most of these little protein clusters over here. Um, and so that's how the diagnosis is made on, on pathology. Okay, so clinically then, what does it mean to have MSA? Where, where does that come from? So MSA is a condition that's characterized by autonomic nervous system problems associated with either Parkinsonism or cerebellar symptoms. So let me just take a step back and what does this autonomic nervous system mean? So the autonomic nervous system is the part of the nervous system that controls things that you have no voluntary control over. So for instance, your blood pressure going up or going down is not something you can sit there and think about and make happen. The brain controls it, the brain makes that happen, but you can't sit there and voluntarily make it happen. Same with your heart rate, heart rate going up, heart rate going down. The brain controls that completely, but you have no voluntary control over it. Same with urination. So as you sat there and drank your coffee during Dr. Litvan's talk this morning, your bladder started to fill and the muscle of the bladder naturally relaxed in order to accommodate that filling. That muscle relaxation is not something you can voluntarily control, like the movements of your hands, which you can voluntarily control and I do quite often when I'm talking. Um, so, so those are all parts of your autonomic nervous system, things that the brain controls the function of, but you can't voluntarily override for the most part. Um, the, um, your your um, stomach um, moving food along into your colon is also another part of the autonomic nervous system. So how quickly those muscles contract in your colon to move food through and aid digestion is something that is completely controlled by the autonomic nervous system. So you can see as I'm saying all these things that these relate directly to the types of symptoms that we see in MSA that are affected by poor regulation by the autonomic nervous system. So let's take a look at those. So the autonomic symptoms are required for the diagnosis. And exactly the, the um, criteria that are used um, in the diagnostic criteria for MSA are fairly strict in, as to how severe these symptoms have to be to get the diagnosis of MSA. And the reason they're fairly strict is that the criteria are actually made for research so that when I recruit patients with MSA into my studies, I'm being as specific as possible to try to make sure I only include patients with MSA. So it turns out there are probably a lot of people who spend a couple of years with symptoms before they actually qualify to have this official diagnosis. This is also, you'll, you'll sometimes hear your doctor say, well, I suspect it's MSA, but you don't quite meet criteria. It's just because the criteria is at a very high bar um, so that we don't go saying someone has MSA who doesn't. So the criteria are always geared towards specificity. So always having, you know, not including anyone in that group who doesn't actually have that disease versus a very sensitive um, marker that would sort of say, well, there's a possibility you have MSA. That's, that's sort of something that would be more broad. That's not how we do our criteria. We try to be as specific as possible um, to avoid telling people they have something that they actually don't have. And that can be a big frustration for patients and families because, you know, they want a definitive diagnosis, but we doctors are not willing to say a definitive diagnosis until you meet these really strict criteria. Um, and that's often why it takes several visits, sometimes several doctors, sometimes several years before someone gives you that actual diagnosis of MSA. Okay, and sometimes the way we phrase this again in our notes, um, some of the uh, lingo we use is possible MSA versus probable MSA. And if it's probable MSA, that means you meet the criteria. If it's possible MSA, that usually means I have a high suspicion, but the person doesn't quite meet the criteria, so I'm not willing to, you know, completely say that's what it is. So that's kind of the phrasing that we sometimes use. So what are some of these symptoms of the autonomic nervous system? So blood pressure control and heart rate are a really big one. And this term orthostatic hypotension is often used, but I don't like narrowing it down to that. So orthostatic hypotension basically means that whenever you're laying down or sitting down and then you stand up, the heart has to work harder to get blood to the brain, okay? And your blood pressure and heart rate actually are controlled by the brain, 
because the brain is the only organ that matters getting blood to. Um, if the brain doesn't get blood, you pass out. That's how the system is, is rigged. And so the reason you pass out is because if you get flat, it's easier to get the blood to the brain. And the brain is very selfish from this perspective. It doesn't care where else the blood is going. It just wants blood itself. It, it, it requires that. So, so if you stand up and you can't get your blood pressure and heart rate high enough to, to compensate for that change to standing, the brain says, I'm not getting enough blood. We're cutting things off and it makes you pass out. And so it's, it's actually an active process of passing out is what happens. What the brain is literally shutting itself off for the purpose of getting you flat so it can get more blood. That's what orthostatic hypotension is. Now, it turns out that in MSA, it's not just the drop in blood pressure we see, but we see elevations in blood pressure. And that often confuses people because you hear orthostatic hypotension, lightheadedness, drops in blood pressure, but actually what we see is fluctuations. Patients go high when they're laying down. They go low when they're standing. Sometimes they go high when they're standing. It's a dysregulation of the nervous system. It's not just the drop in the blood pressure. It's a dysregulation. Patients' heart rates will go high. They'll go low for no real reason or just based on a tiny little trigger. So it goes high because you know, they stood up a little bit too quickly and then drops low for some other reason. So it's a dysregulation. Things go up, things go down, not quite as tightly regulated as they should. So that's sort of a, a broad way of thinking about blood pressure. The urinary difficulties and incontinence. So think about what I was just saying this morning, a few minutes ago. You drink your coffee, your bladder naturally relaxes to fill up, and then you give the conscious signal, I want to urinate, and now the bladder contracts in a very organized way. Well, when that whole system is dysregulated, you don't get the relaxation you should, and so the, the bladder is, is tight and spastic when it shouldn't be, when it should be relaxing, and that leads to release of urine. Um, usually, we voluntarily can say, okay, I want the bladder to relax now. Well, these involuntary s signals go down to the bladder and make it contract when you had no intention of having your bladder contract. So again, it's a dysregulation of this system. And it can go either way in MSA. So it can be that the bladder stays really loose and open and it won't contract ever, and that's called uh, a distended bladder. Or it can be tightening and contracting when it shouldn't, and that's called a spastic bladder. They're kind of important to differentiate because the way we treat them is different. Obviously, if we, if we have a big distended bladder, we want to treat it with something that's going to make it contract. If we have a spastic contracted bladder, we want to treat it with something that makes it relax. So the difference between those two um, can be important, and often a urologist is the one who can make the distinction between which one of those two things is going on. In general, in MSA, the, um, the, uh, the over-relaxation often tends to be the case where the bladder won't contract properly. It just sort of extends and extends and won't contract. But that's not always the case. Some patients do have a spastic bladder. And guess what? You can have both, too, which can make it even more challenging. Okay, so the sleep difficulty. So similar to the other things I described, the process of falling asleep is a control over the autonomic nervous system. So when you fall asleep, certain muscles relax, and in fact, certain muscles come, become completely paralyzed. When you start dreaming, your entire body actually becomes paralyzed, so you don't act out those dreams. In MSA, and this is actually true also in Parkinson's disease and dementia with Lewy body, so this is true across all the synucleinopathies, there is often something called this REM sleep behavior disorder, and I apologize, I did not spell it out, I just wrote down RBD, but that stands for REM sleep behavior disorder. And what that means is that when you're dreaming, your body isn't properly paralyzed and you act out those dreams. You might scream, you might throw fists, you might kick. Um, I've had patients who have literally thrown themselves out of the bed before trying to, uh, trying to fight someone. We don't understand this, but it typically happens um, when patients are in some engaged in some sort of very active dream where they're fighting someone off. Why that's the case, we don't really know. So, so they'll feel like they're, you know, they're going into a sword fight or a fist fight against someone. Um, this can this can often happen and is quite common in MSA, but also is in in other um, Parkinsonian disorders. And then obstructive sleep apnea. Again, the control of when you're in that deep sleep and you're paralyzed. How much tone do you have in your throat? 
how deep do you take a breath? Do you have pauses during your sleeping? These things are all controlled by the autonomic nervous system, and it's very common for sleep apnea to occur in MSA. This is a very, very common condition in the general population, but it's just more common in folks with MSA. And then difficulties with sexual function as well is something that's very commonly, again, this is, this is a, um, something that is um, controlled completely by the autonomic nervous system. And so this can be another aspect of, of that difficulty. So the Parkinsonism part is exactly what I just said. It's the slowness, that bradykinesia, the stiffness, the rigidity, sometimes some tremulousness, and um, often gait and balance problems. And if someone's first motor symptoms, these are not considered motor symptoms, these are considered non-motor symptoms, these two are considered motor symptoms. So if the first motor symptoms are of this flavor, then we call it MSAP. And this was just a subclassification to uh, distinguish the people who are more Parkinsonian and those who are more um, incoordinated or cerebellar. So the cerebellar signs, so the cerebellum is the part of the brain in the very back in the low part. It's the part of the brain that controls very fine coordination. So as you reach out to grab a glass, you have to make these fine little adjustments to your movement. Or let's say you're grabbing a glass as it's moving along a table, you have to sort of compensate. That's what the cerebellum does. So it's that fine motor coordination. So patients who have cerebellar problems have what we call ataxia, which is very poor coordination. That can be hand ataxia, where as you're reaching for your glass, you can't quite get it. It can be truncal ataxia, so as you're standing, you can't quite hold your balance without putting your feet really wide apart from one another. Um, the closer your feet are together, the more unstable you feel. So we call that trunk ataxia or limb ataxia to separate those. Um, it can be, as I said, limb movements or trunk. Speech problems is actually part of the coordination. The soft speech is probably coming from this part of the brain. Um, the discoordinated speech problems that some MSA patients have comes from the back of the brain, the cerebellum. So um, the difficulty with the rhythmicity of the speech and, and things like that often comes from there. And then swallowing problems, interestingly, are also very much coordinated from the cerebellum. Um, swallowing requires a very high level of coordination in the muscles of your throat. You have to block off the part um, of your, of your um, that goes down to the trachea, so you have to block off your windpipe. You have to open up your esophagus. You need to coordinate the efforts of all those muscles. It's actually a very coordinated um, um, enterprise to swallow things. And so that is um, partly cerebellar, partly autonomic nervous system that's involved there. Now, what's challenging about MSA is that the different symptoms are completely different in two patients. I can have two patients that don't have a single symptom that overlaps and never will. Some patients have more of the blood pressure problems. Others have more of the urinary difficulties. Some patients are very, very Parkinsonian and have no cerebellar symptoms at all. Other patients just have the cerebellar symptoms and never have any slowness or stiffness. Patients look completely different. This is why this was three totally different syndromes until Dr. Pape realized that the underlying pathology was the same. And this is one of the biggest challenges diagnostically for clinicians who aren't as familiar with the broad spectrum of different treatment of different symptoms patients can have because it's very hard to to see two patients that don't have a single symptom in common and yet call them the same disease. That's very challenging for, for doctors. Um, we like to have things in nice, tidy little boxes for our diagnoses, and this does not fit a nice, tidy little box. Um, so it can be very hard to lead to the diagnosis. So how common is it? It's about five pe about one to five people per, per 100,000. Um, those are probably, again, underestimations because it is um, not properly diagnosed in a lot of places where you um, don't have neurologists or specialists in movement disorders who don't recognize MSA. Um, so I'm betting that's an underestimation. More common in, in individuals over the age of 50. Mean onset in the sixth decade, but it really anyone over the age of 30 is, it, is, is I don't think there have been any cases under the age of 30 um, reported with MSA. And there have been cases reported up into um, onset in, in um, 70s and 80s. But that's just less common. Usually it's people in their 50s and 60s um, or 40s, 50s and 60s that are diagnosed. So it's a big, broad range. Again, that makes it very difficult for diagnosis because, you know, 30 to 90 is a big, big window of, of uh, possibilities. Okay, so how do we diagnose it with all of this confusion in the air? Um, 
it's pretty much based on clinical and, and, hist- and physical exam. There's no blood test. There's no spinal tap. There's no MRI scan that can definitively either diagnose MSA or definitively say you don't have MSA. This is a clinically based diagnosis given these criteria that we have um, that um, have evolved over time and become better and better. But um, And in fact, it was just, I think, three years ago, the second consensus statement for um, the diagnosis of MSA came out. So three years ago, they revised the criteria to make them better, um, but they're still not perfect. And so it's, it's a difficult diagnosis. And this is one of my my big areas of, of research interest because I think that um, this is a big problem. You know, we, we can't come up with better treatments if we can't properly diagnose patients. I mean, that's just logic. And so, um, and it's extremely frustrating for patients and families to go years. I, I'm, I'm betting that most people in this room um, can, you know, name several doctors, several hospitals, several years of wondering what the heck is going on and going to the medical profession and not having an answer that occurred before they finally got the diagnosis. This is a big problem in our field. Um, we do often get brain imaging and, and blood work, but that's usually to rule out other things. So we usually get an MRI scan to make sure the person doesn't have a tumor or a stroke or some structural lesion that could be causing the symptoms. So it's basically these are to find other causes um, of, of, of Parkinsonism or autonomic dysfunction or cerebellar dysfunction. But it's, it, they don't directly diagnose MSA in any way. There are some things that we can sometimes see on the, um, on the uh, MRI scan that are suggestive, but they're not specific in any way, and they usually occur later um, in symptoms, so they're not useful in early diagnosis at all. So this is, this is a problem. This is a big um, need that we have in, um, in the MSA community that we need to find a better solution for. So let's just talk a little bit about uh, treatments, okay? So the way that I think of treatments is, is um, based on a couple of different factors. Um, currently, there's when I say no treatment, I'll describe what I mean a little bit more. I mean no pharmacological treatment. Uh, we have symptomatic treatments for the motor symptoms and for the motor symptoms. And then all of our research goals are basically in this category, to find something that protects the brain once someone has MSA so it doesn't get worse, and obviously something to restore um, the, the ultimate um, uh, problems that are causing MSA. These are, these are research goals at the moment. So first of all, we don't have a currently proven treatment that provides either a cure or slows the progression. This is unfortunately true for MSA, PSP, CBD, Parkinson's disease. In fact, this is, this is pretty much true for almost every neurological disease out there. This is true for Alzheimer's disease. This is a big, big issue in, in, um, in medicine, in neurology in particular, is that we don't really have um, any treatments that can um, potentially cure or slow the progression of most neurological diseases, not all but most. So all the treatments currently are aimed at symptomatic control. So that's an important kind of framework to think about because if a symptom is there but it's not causing significant problems in your day-to-day life, it might not be something you need to seek a treatment for. On the flip side of that, if a treatment, if you're given a treatment it makes one thing better, but it makes side effects that cause another thing to be worse, it might not be worth it. And the reason I say these things is that my approach to patients is that, you know, whenever they tell me a a symptom, it's usually followed up with how is this impacting your daily quality of life? Because what often happens is that we doctors want to fix things. It's kind of why we went into medicine is that we want to help people and fix things. But that can actually be a problem because patients want to tell you everything that's going on and they should. And so they, we hear these symptoms and we say, okay, we need treatments to fix all of these things. But if that symptom isn't actually interfering that much with what you're doing, you might actually get over-treated with things that you don't really need to be on or with treatments that are making that one thing that didn't bother you so much better, but then it's causing something else to be worse. And so this is always a good way of thinking about it. So I just want to encourage you all when you see your doctors to tell them your symptoms, but then follow it up with how that symptom is impacting your daily quality of life. Because that's a good framework to always think about your symptoms with. Your doctor wants to know the symptoms, but then you need to say how that is impacting your daily quality of life. Now, it's important to tell them about it, whether you feel like it's impacting your daily quality of life or not, because your doctor might have a slightly different opinion. And let me give you an example of that. If someone came to me and said, well, I get lightheaded about twice a day when I stand up and I 
actually pass out from that about once or twice a week, but it's not really bothering me. I haven't hurt myself yet. That would bother me. And I would feel like, you know, we actually do need to do something about that. Even though you feel like it's not bothering you yet, you very well might break a hip with these falls, hit your head with these falls. We need to come up with a better solution to get you know, twice a week passing out and falling all the way to the ground is is a problem. Let's try to come up with a better solution. So in that case, there's a mismatch between the patient's perspective of whether it's bothering them and my perspective, because I know that when people fall, they often hit their head. And unfortunately, they often end up in the hospital when that happens. Now, something that might be the opposite is if the patient says, you know what, this tremor is really bothering me. Uh, or this tremor has really started in my in my hand, and the doctor says, "Oh, tremor! I actually can do something about tremor. Here's some drugs, and those those pills cause your blood pressure to drop and make it even harder for you to stand up. But your tremor's better. But it turned out your tremor was in your non-dominant hand, and it didn't bother you anyway. So now you're taking pills to help something that wasn't really bothering you, that's causing a side effect, that's making something that is bothering you worse. So that's why that communication with your doctor, not just saying the symptom, but saying how is that symptom impacting my daily quality of life is an important communication point. Okay, so if you don't need to take something for one of your symptoms, what else can you do? So I'm going to talk a little bit about exercise, but I'm going to keep it pretty brief because I know there's a session after lunch about from a physical therapist who's going to talk a little bit more about this. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, sort of the roles of things like uh, vitamins and supplements because um, people um, often come to me and ask me questions. Um, research I'm going to talk about at the very end, and then I don't need to speak to this group about support groups and things like that. Since you've all chosen to spend your Saturday here, you understand how important it is to to have a a very um, solid base of, of support around you. So exercise. It's really important, and it's really hard to do, particularly in MSA. And let's just talk about a couple of a couple of reasons why it's important, and then a couple of ways that we can overcome the challenges. So exercise reduces the likelihood of falls, reduces the likelihood of frozen joints, and reduces deconditioning. The way I try to explain it to patients is that you want the muscles in your body that are working well to be working at 100% effort because they've got to make up for the ones that aren't working well. And the only way to make that happen is through exercise and through working on those muscles because there's a lot of compensation in the body. There's a lot of things that we can make up for. But what happens is that people feel like they can't participate in any physical activity, and then they become deconditioned. The muscles that were normal and working fine become weaker, and then they can't help at all with the muscles that aren't working well. So it becomes a bit of a, a vicious cycle that happens. It can enhance mood and energy. And there are some animal models, not in humans, but in animals, that suggest that exercise actually can slow down the loss of brain cells in Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease. The studies have not been done in MSA, so I can't say for sure whether that is um, the case, but it is suggestive in Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. So there's this one study that I found from 2008 that showed the impact of resistance training on balance and functional ability um, in a patient with MSA, and they found that the addition of resistance training um, did not have any adverse effects in this person and appeared to lead to improvements in balance and functional ability. Now, this was one patient. It was a case report, which is very weak uh, evidence, but it is it is something to think about. So, so options for, for, for exercise, I'm just going to put them up here. You guys can look at them in your pamphlet. The one thing I'm going to stress here is um, there's this exercise tape that the Parkinson's Disease Foundation puts out. And it's a DVD that includes seated exercises specifically designed to address Parkinsonian movement challenges such as balance, flexibility, walking, posture, vocal range, and facial expression, all challenges that are also present in MSA. So even if you can't stand up, you can exercise. You can do light resistance weights. You can do range of motion work. Those things still are very helpful. So even if you can't stand, you can still get some physical exercise. And obviously, always talk to your doctor about heart rate and blood pressure issues because that's always the concern with exercise and MSA, okay? So just briefly, I want to I wanna address the issue of things like vitamins and supplements. I take a daily vitamin, um, but I don't take higher doses than what's recommended by the FDA. And the reason is um, there's a lot of things that are out there that are extremely expensive that have absolutely no evidence to support them and potentially could be harmful. 
and um, and there are just two quick issues that I want to I want to address, and I want you guys to always ask yourself before you take any type of of supplement, what's the evidence to support doing this? What's the safety record, and does the j data justify the expense? So just briefly, this is a quote from, I believe, a 16th century philosopher, that the only difference between a medicine and a poison is dose, um, which I love that quote because it really, I think, for physicians is, a, is something that we always need to remember. And this is just, just two key points that I, I want you guys to always think about when it comes to treatments. Any substance or treatment that has the biological potential to help you has the biological potential to harm you, okay? So if someone says, oh, there's no side effects to this, that means there's no chance it's going to help you, okay? There's no such thing as a free lunch in biology. If it has the chance to help you, it has the chance to cause side effects. The nervous system works very in a very complicated fashion, and if you do anything that helps to enhance one thing, it has the potential to harm another. So always, everything we do in medicine is always balancing those risks and benefits. So there is no free lunch. If someone says this has no side effects, they're not telling you the whole truth. Okay, and this is just an example. Actually, did you know that the seeds of an apple are mildly poisonous and that they contain a small amount of this um, cyanide? The quantity is usually not enough to cause any harm to humans, but it is p possible to eat enough apple seeds to cause a fatal dose. So Key fact number two, natural does not equal safe. Oh, it's natural. That means it's safe. Not true at all. One of the world's most toxic neurological substances is botulinum toxin, which is a protein that is produced by a bacterium, uh, similar to the way that we get penicillin, one of the best uh, antibiotics. Um, it, this is the world's most toxic neuro, uh, neurotoxin. It completely paralyzes the entire nervous system when people get botulinum. It turns out that we also use it as Botox for cosmetic and medical purposes when it is um, given in a dose and a, um, and a treatment way that is, um, that is not harmful. So, sit. so natural does not equal safe. So just keep those ideas in mind when you think about treatments. So we're just going to briefly go through some treatments um, of, of medications. So Cinemet, many of you know, is carbidopa levodopa. This is the mainstay of treatment for Parkinson's disease. This can help the slowness and the stiffness. It will not help the coordination problems, and it potentially can drop blood pressure. So I only give Cinemet to patients who are having, in, with MSA, who are having issues with slowness and stiffness, not with those who are having just coordination problems or just blood pressure problems. So again, it's important to ask your doctor, what is this supposed to help? Blood pressure instability. So first thing to consider, removing medications that might cause blood pressure drops, liberal salt and fluid intake, smaller, more frequent meals. These are, these are good interventions that can often help. High um, compression stockings are extremely helpful, but very hard to use. So um, I think they're great if you can use them, but the, the reality is that they're very, very hard to use. Um, for low blood pressure, these are the two main medications, um, fluorocortisone and mitodrin. Good way to think about these two is that fluorocortisone, it basically increases salt and water retention. It fills the tank. It keeps you from being dehydrated. As a side effect, it causes a little bit of swelling in the ankles. That's fine. That's what, it, if it's doing that, it means it's working. If it causes a lot of swelling in the ankles, talk to your doctor about it. Mitodrin squeezes the tank, so it causes blood pressure constriction. So if you're dehydrated, this does not work. You can't squeeze an empty tank and help your blood pressure. So they work together. They, they often work together. Some patients just need to be on one or the other, but they often work together. Um, but be cautious of high blood pressure when you lay down because they raise blood pressure in all situations. So they help you when you stand up, but then when you lay down and your blood pressure is normally 150, it bumps it up to 180. So just be careful about that. And again, talk to your doctor about, about these medications if you're considering them. The urinary symptoms, um, the anticholinergics are a medication that can help the spasms, but if you have a loose bladder, that doesn't, or that's not going to help at all. Intermittent catheterization can often be helpful. And I have a lot of patients that have decided to do a permanent um, suprapubic catheter and actually found that this has made a world of difference in their quality of life because now they're not having to do regular 
catheterizations. They're not having to worry about accidents. They're not having to run to the bathroom every 20 minutes. Um, it's, it is a surgical procedure, but it's an outpatient procedure, but it can be actually quite helpful in certain situations. Just something to consider. Sleep problems. Um, I always recommend being officially evaluated by a sleep doctor. They do a much better job of really teasing apart if it's obstructive sleep apnea or REM sleep behavior disorder than we neurologists do. So I always recommend patients actually see a um, sleep doctor. We have a fabulous sleep clinic at Stanford. There's also a very good sleep clinic at, um, at UCSF and at Kaiser. This is just a list for you guys to look at at your leisure of non-pharmacologic treatment strategies. This comes from a um, paper that I wrote a couple years ago to, uh, to uh, a general neurology journal that um, just includes uh, recommendations for non-pharmacologic treatments for a bunch of different um, disorders. Just I wanted you guys to have that so you could take a look and you know maybe bring it into your doctor and see if they have any thoughts on it. Okay, so research. Last couple minutes. The goal of research is to provide better symptomatic treatment, obviously, to find a way to slow disease progression and ultimately we want to cure. Um, I looked last night on clinicaltrials.gov and there were 43 clinical trials listed in the United States for multiple system atrophy. 15 were currently recruiting or are going to be recruiting soon. So it's not a huge number, but that there is active research going on in, in the United States. And this is just the United States. Um, these are two drugs that are currently under medication trials right now. Resagiline, um, both of these are closed, unfortunately. They're not accepting any new patients, but they both are things that you guys should keep an eye out for in the literature soon. Resagiline um, is a drug for Parkinson's disease, and it's being looked at in MSA. Rifampin or Rifampicin is a drug that's currently approved for tuberculosis, and um, there was some evidence to show that um, there's a, um, basically that Rifampicin might be able to help with some of this protein, abnormal protein synthesis of that alpha synuclein protein. Um, so they are hoping that it could potentially prevent or reverse the protein clumping. Um, this study uh, is being led by a group at, at UCLA, and they just finished recruitment. I think it's going to be about a year before we see any results, so just kind of keep your eyes open for that one. In the last two minutes, I want to talk about a very controversial um, study, because I don't know if any of you guys have um, heard about this one, but if you have, I wanted to put my two cents worth. So um, this is a study that was done out of Korea. They showed in 2008, they basically, these are stem cells that they inject into the carotid arteries. So the carotid arteries are these two main arteries that go to your brain. And the reason why they injected them there was because the stem cells are not going to get into the brain. They're not going to pass through the blood-brain barrier. Any, anything injected into the, into the veins or the arteries will not pass into the brain. You've got to put stuff directly into the brain. But what they wanted was the nutrients that these stem cells um, produce to cross into the brain. And if you inject somewhere else in the body, they're going to be cleared out by the liver. So they literally were injecting right in the carotid arteries. So next stop is the brain, and all those nutrients would go straight to the brain as a way of trying to protect the nerve cells. And uh, two months ago, they released their, um, their secondary um, study, and this was 33 patients. Half of them got um, treatment, half of them got placebo, so basically just saline injections. And it was a positive study. The folks who got the treatment um, did look a little bit better on their clinical ratings um, at about 180 days after the treatment. However, this is just a quote from a, um, a commentary. Um, there were significant concerns about safety, um, a significant a percentage, 30% of the stem cell treated and 35% of the um, saline treated patients developed ischemic lesions. Those are strokes um, um, on MRI, and at least one subject had neurological deficits that required coming out of the study. The authors seemed rather cavalier in dismissing this problem, which I agree. I was not impressed with their discussion of this problem in the paper. Um, the mechanism was also unclear. Um, if you're providing growth factors, this is a very transient um, benefit, and so repeat infusions are likely necessary. So um, it, the, currently, this approach carries unacceptable risk, which I agree with. However, um, this is not a cure, but it may have the potential of leading of, of, of delaying progression. So what they recommended, and I agree with all these recommendations, that the study needs to be repeated in a multi-center study. Um, it needs to be done only when the safety factor can be addressed and the third of patients aren't getting strokes. It needs to be carried out in both MSAP and MSAC. The study was only done in MSAC. 
And um, if the benefits appear to be transient, the um, the frequency needs to be um, needs to be addressed. So I think this is a promising therapy. This is not something I would recommend anyone to go out and get today. Um, obviously, the risk of strokes in a third of patients is very very significant, um, and is not not a benign treatment by any means. But the science did show that there might be some potential treatment here. So this is a possibility for the future. Um, how quickly this is going to move forward, and whether the United States sites are going to to, um, uh, I know of some places that are that are looking into getting FDA approval to run run a study similar to this, but um, but it's still in the works of how to improve the safety issues. So just wanted to let you guys know about that. Okay, so the rest of the slides, I'm just going to actually breeze through because my time is officially up. So all I wanted you guys to think about is consider participating in research studies for MSA. Um, one of the facts that the Michael J. Fox Foundation puts out is that 30% of all clinical trials fail to recruit a single person in the United States. 85% of clinical trials face delays due to limited participation. Every clinical trial I have ever run has taken twice as long to recruit patients than we initially expected. It's a big, big problem. Um, fewer than 10% of Parkinsonian patients ever take part in any type of clinical study, despite more than 85% saying that they really want to help move research move forward. So this is just, I'm going to just go through these the of different studies that are going on in my lab, but I have this flyer here. If anybody wants to consider participation in, uh, we're doing a study doing imaging in MSA. It's not a treatment. There's no treatments that we have available, but, um, but if anyone is interested in hearing more about our research studies, I have a flyer up here. I also have a flyer for um, healthy controls who do not have MSA who might be interested in participating in research studies. So that's all. Thank you so much, and we're going to have some time for questions. You know, speak to the difficulties of blood pressure issues when moving from horizontal to vertical positions mm -hmm. and the use of chlorinap. Did I get that? Is that okay? Great. Yeah. So I think that's one of the biggest quality of life issues in MSA patients, and. Um, Again, so the way that Florinef works is it helps to keep you from being dehydrated. What happens in MSA patients is because of the urinary symptoms, they're very reluctant to drink anything because they don't want to have accidents. So they end up slightly dehydrated, which then worsens the um, blood pressure problem. It's a really, really vicious cycle between the urinary and the blood pressure. It's, it's probably the biggest struggle that we have. Florinef helps to fill the tank, so it helps to keep you from being dehydrated, but it can cause swelling because it basically just... It's, it's simply a, um, a, a mineral corticoid that's actually naturally produced by your body um, that helps you retain salt and water. So it's basically the equivalent of taking a bunch of salt tabs and drinking a bunch of water during the day. It helps you to retain water. So it does help to reduce the lightheadedness, but, um, but it's not going to fix the problem. It doesn't actively raise your blood pressure that much. It just keeps you from getting dehydrated and making it worse. Um, but some patients do tell me it does make them urinate more. So something, something to, that's, a, again... Everything's got a downside. You've got to balance the two. Um, yeah. And one question we had in mm -hmm. our local support group meeting, is dementia an exclusionary uh, criteria for it? Yeah, say? great question. So in the official consensus criteria, this has been hotly debated, the first consensus criteria, I think from 2001, 2002, did have dementia as an exclusion criteria. Since then, it has been recognized that some patients do have some cognitive or thinking changes associated with MSA, but they typically do not meet criteria for dementia. So the definition of dementia is that you have memory or thinking problems to the degree that you have to stop doing certain daily activities, such as driving because of the memory problems. Um, you can't do your taxes because of the memory problems. Basically, it's impacting something. And so Patients clearly can have some memory problems, but it is typically not nearly to the degree of dementia like we see in pretty much every other neurodegenerative um, disease like Parkinson's disease and PSP and CBD. Yeah. And another question, too, that we've had in local support group meetings. Um, there have been some patients that have had a diagnosis mm -hmm. or probable diagnosis mm -hmm. of MSA, but they don't have the, the blood pressure issues. Yeah. Yeah. So does that exclude MSA? No. So the, the way that the criteria are written is that you have to have autonomic dysfunction and you have to meet one of two criteria. It's either the blood pressure or the urinary symptoms are, are kind of get you that criteria. So 
if you have um, severe urinary uh, frequency or urinary incontinence, even if you don't have the blood pressure problems, you still meet the autonomic dysfunction criteria. Um, the constipation is not included on the criteria because it's just too darn common in people over the age of 50. Um, same with the sleep, the sleep disorder problems. They're like obstructive sleep apnea is just too common of a thing, whereas the orthostatic hypotension and the urinary incontinence are specific enough to MSA that those are included in the criteria. The other things are kind of secondary criteria, but it doesn't get you the probable diagnosis. So this one is, what is the cause of blepospasm, mm -hmm. um, and how is it related to the progression of MSA mm -hmm. or the ingestion uh, of, of lethal dose? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, yeah. So blepospasm is um, forced eye contraction. So eyes close like this. It can be an isolated symptom, so um, patients can have blepharospasm and absolutely nothing wrong with their entire neurological um, disease. I, I treat a lot of those patients in my clinic. Or it can be part of a neurodegenerative disease. It's seen in uh, cortical basal degeneration. It can be seen in MSA. It can be seen in Parkinson's disease. Um, rarely in PSP, but it's not impossible. So basically, it's just one of those symptoms that can come along with neurological disease. Um, it sometimes does get worse with levodopa. Um, actually, there are many facial movements that can sometimes get worse with levodopa. So some patients complain of some, um, some what we call facial dyskinesias, I think is the word I used in the, in the pamphlet. So kind of these extra facial movements that sometimes happen, a little more sensitivity to that in MSA than in Parkinson's disease for some reason. Leprospasm is actually very well treated with botulinum toxin. Um, a little bit of Botox um, actually is the state-of-the-art treatment for this in patients with either idio either isolated blepharospasm or blepharospasm as part of a neurodegenerative disease. We just do a little bit of Botox right above the lid and below, and it helps to reduce the contractions. It doesn't make them go away, but it can reduce them quite a bit so your eyes aren't closing quite as much. And um, injury cause MSA. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so there's no direct, so injury like uh, trauma or trauma, head trauma, yeah. something like that. So there's no direct evidence that Things like a head trauma or um, whiplash or any of those kinds of things cause MSA. However, there is this general suggestion, and this is true for every neurodegenerative disease, Parkinson's disease, MSA, PSP, that those things might, might increase risk. So, so what we think causes most of these, again, so everything that Dr. Lipman talked about today um, are not genetic diseases, so we don't have a true genetic cause. So what we think is that it's a combination of probably some genetic risk factors plus some environmental exposures, whether it's, you know, um, pesticide toxins or head injuries or things like that. We, we have, we're, we're hand-waving here. We don't really understand this. So there is some suggestion that, 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 um, that frequent head injuries during life can increase your risk in general of neurodegenerative diseases, but it's not specific to MSA. And no one's really figured these things these things out, sort of what the connection is. So I think it's really hard to know at this time. But there's no direct connection that, we, that we've ever been able to show. Okay. Um, what issues should MSA patients considering filling out advanced directives on end-of-life treatment? Yeah, that's a really good question. And actually, there are some specific issues to MSA. So as I mentioned, that sleep apnea is, is a problem. And... Um, what patients will sometimes notice is that they um, have breathing difficulties where they <gasps> kind of make those types of noises. We call that strider um, when you when basically you're having trouble breathing. And patients will have that at night when they're when they have sleep apnea. And some patients will start to have that during the day. Um, and that type of, of problem um, sometimes can be fixed um, with having a tracheostomy, basically a breathing tube put in. But not everybody wants that. I mean, that's, that's, again, that's a big deal to sort of make that decision. And I think that's something that patients with MSA need to consider whether or not that's something they want. Um, the other advanced directive is that they need to consider is the issue of a feeding tube. So swallowing problems, very, very common in MSA. And some people, you know, feel like under no circumstances do I want to have a feeding tube put in if I can't swallow on my own. Other people feel like, you know what, I'm fine with that as long as other things, I'm able to do other things. So that's a, com a conversation to definitely have with your, with your um, loved ones, the, the issues of 
um, the breathing tube and the issues of the feeding tube. Because both breathing and swallowing are specific issues to MSA that people should consider. Another great question. So um, we have accidentally done a DPS in one or two patients with MSA who we thought had Parkinson's disease and then ended up having MSA, and um, neither of them did very well with the DBS. They, they both, unfortunately, um, didn't do well at all. And then a paper came out a couple of years ago out of uh, Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston that had a series of these of patients who had accidentally, um, who had gotten DBS, that thought they had Parkinson's disease, and then clearly it was, it was MSA in the next couple of years. And it showed that across the board, actually, not only did it not help but it sometimes worsened things. So specifically, speaking problems, swallowing problems, breathing problems were, were worsened post-DBS. So current recommendations are that DBS is not an option for patients with MSA. Now, we're constantly looking at new targets in the brain and different um, approaches to DBS. So this could change in the future, but based on the, um, the way we do DBS today, it looks like it's not just not helpful, it has the potential to worsen breathing, um, swallowing, and speaking. Um, so I do not recommend it. And um, do we have um, MSA and Parkinson's disease combined? So um, you can't have MSA and Parkinson's disease. Well, I mean, you can, uh, as, my, as my old mentor used to say, you can always have measles and a broken leg. <laughs> um, so <laughs> there's nothing in life that precludes us from having multiple uh, related neurological conditions, but it would be very, very, very rare um, to have MSA and Parkinson's disease. Now, as I said, Parkinsonism is an umbrella term that just describes the clinical syndrome, and MSA is a pathologically defined disease underneath that umbrella. So oftentimes patients will be told, oh, you have Parkinsonism, you, and you have MSA, you have atypical Parkinsonism, you have shy drager syndrome. They're all saying the same thing, they're just saying it a little bit differently. MSA is the most specific description because it's describing not just the clinical syndrome, but the suspicion of the clinician that this is the underlying pathology. So that's the most specific term. Parkinsonism is the most generic term. It's that it just means slowness, stiffness, you know, tremor and, and, and balance problems. So that's it. Yeah. So that's the only study that has been done. I have, um, I happen to know of some patients that have um, gone to other countries and gotten um, stem cells injected in their spinal cord, and I have not seen any benefit of those um, couple of patients. Um, let me just sort of put a little context out there on on this issue because there are websites in different countries that are saying, "Hey, we have the cure to these." rare diseases, come give us $50,000 or whatnot, and, and we'll give you stem cells. Um, as I mentioned, there's no, there's no neurodegenerative disease that we have a cure for right now, and very few that we have any possibility of slowing the progression. So as a physician, if I had a treatment that definitively actually helped um, slow the progression or cured MSA, I would win the Nobel Prize for it. It would be that big of a deal. The first person to actually get a cure or a true aggressive way to stop the progression of one of these neurodegenerative diseases is going to be a big deal. So if someone is offering money to do this and they haven't published in scientific journals, they have no proof that their system works at all. This is something that someone would, I mean, it would be a big, big deal. So don't trust claims that, that go with those kinds of things. Um, again, it's, it's something to always, you know, ask your doctor what's the evidence for it. You know, it can be. This was not included in the first consensus criteria, but then since then, um, pain has become more and more of a, of a recognized syndrome. And I have to say, I have patients who have completely unexplained pain. I can't figure out where the heck it's coming from. It's not arthritis. It's, it's not stiffness. It's just pain. And I, I believe it's probably coming from the autonomic nervous system. It's a dysregulation problem, but I don't fully understand it, but absolutely, I have patients who have unexplained pain that I have a very hard time um, getting to the bottom of. I typically send them to my pain center at Stanford because those folks are much better at coming up with really um, interesting treatments for, 
for uh, chronic pain rather than, you know, just putting someone on, on just a, a typical medication. But um, absolutely, and I don't understand it, and I think it's a much bigger problem than most doctors recognize. I've been reading about a new drug, Rebitra, that has been out um, waiting for FDA approval. Are you familiar with it, Jeanette, or is it? So I've heard a little bit about it, but I honestly have to say I have not yet um, gone through the articles to, to get um, any more details on it. As someone had a poster on it at the last uh, Movement Disorders uh, conference in June, and I, I haven't had a chance to really read up on it, so I do apologize. I don't have good information on that one yet. I have extreme high and low blood pressure. How should the cardiac cardiologist properly treat me? It's on metoprolol, but a metoprolol. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's the really hard one. Um, so if it's always low, we have drugs to make it high. If it's always high, we have drugs to make it low. But none of our drugs regulate. They just push up or they push down. So the only way that I have found to handle this is to try to figure out if there's some sort of pattern throughout the day of when things are high and when things are low. For instance, if someone's really, really, really high first thing in the morning, sometimes um, because they've been sleeping all night, laying flat, and that pushes the blood pressure up, sometimes putting a little bit of a blood pressure lowering medication like metoprolol at night can help lower that high blood pressure in the morning. But then if at 1 o'clock in the afternoon after lunch they tend to run really low and that's when they pass out a lot, a little bit of a blood pressure hiring agent around noontime can help. But if it's you've got to be able to figure out if there's some pattern to it. If, if there's some, you know, a specific time of day where, where there's the biggest high problem or the biggest low problem. And it tends to go with what you're doing. When The, the more you're flat, the higher it's going to go. The more you're up walking, the more you're eating, that's going to drive it down. So those are things that can push in one direction or another. But it's it's very very difficult. So the timing is the only way that I've been able to find to work around that. Um, do you recommend acupuncture for every face? Do any any of your patients have experience with that? You know, um, I um, I for pain. yeah for for pain. So so acupuncture has specifically been found to be helpful in certain pain syndromes in neurology. I have a lot of migraine patients who do acupuncture. Um, I have um, low back pain patients that do acupuncture. Um, it tends to have a very brief uh, time in which it works, so a couple days, maybe a week, it's, it's not sustained. Um, I don't understand how it works. I don't really care that I don't understand how it works, if it works. Um, but but if it, if it I, I, I don't think it's, I don't, there's no evidence to show that it's been particularly harmful um, in patients with pain so far. I do have some patients that have reported it can be quite expensive, but if you're really, really having a hard time dealing with pain, um, I, it's not a bad idea to try. Um, the, um, if a patient does uh, with MSA has a DVS, can you turn it off? Have yeah, you can always turn off the stimulators. Um, you know, and in fact, uh, we don't we don't often remove them because it's a surgical procedure to physically remove them, and you're exposing yourself to infection and anesthesia and all that kind of stuff to get them removed. But it is possible we have had people that because of infection, have had to have them removed. But even if you don't have them removed, it can always be, be turned off. We have Parkinson's patients who, for whatever reason, it just isn't working with them or it's causing a side effect that's, that's unwanted and we just turn it off. Um, Lewy Body has a life death protection for three to four years with MSA treatment. So um, there was a fascinating paper that was just published, and I, I, I'm forgetting the exact number, so forgive me if, if you look this up and I'm not exactly correct, um, that had a handful, I think it was four MSA patients pathologically confirmed that it had a lifespan of 20 years from time of first symptom. Um, and I, I think it was a really important paper to show us that, that these averages that you see in, in scientific journals and that are published and people talk about are averages. And um, they're not, they don't show this broad span. I have patients who have had symptoms for over 10 years um, and are, you know, having challenges but are doing okay. I have other patients who unfortunately progress very, very quickly over the span of a couple of years. We don't understand why the broad range in progression exists, but it really does um, you know, and so I would say that there's there's absolutely nothing to say that an MSA patient can't live with symptoms for, for 20 years. It's obviously been shown in this one case report. Um, so I wouldn't consider it a death sentence. I would, 
I would, you know, always be hopeful that you're in that, that higher longevity group. And honestly, I think that the numbers we use are based on data from the 1980s and 1990s before doctors were more aggressive and doing things like treating blood pressure, treating obstructive sleep apnea, you know, treating these different things. Um, you know, we, we weren't aggressive about physical therapy and, and speech therapy to help with, with contractures and infections and, and swallowing problems. So I think if we did the epidemiologic study today, those numbers would be very different. Um, do you see any difference in so in general, in across the board with neurodegenerative diseases, uh, women tend to have a slightly longer longevity than men, but it's very, very small. Um, that, and that's, that's the data mostly comes from the Alzheimer's disease literature, a little bit from the PD literature. Um, but other than that, we don't see it specifically in MSA. Yeah. And so are you in currently doing clinical trials uh, personally? Or? So I'm doing, I'm doing research um, imaging studies. So again, my focus right now is trying to develop a better diagnostic tool. And so I, I'm part of a multi-center study um, where we're doing a couple different ty types of um, uh, imaging to try to come up with a definitive way of actually diagnosing patients with MSA. And also um, through that, it's functional imaging. So it's actually looking at the brain function to try to identify better targets for something like DBS. As many of you might know, Stanford has a really big DBS center. And so what I want to do is try to um, see if we can use our functional imaging techniques to see if we can identify where in the brain would be a better target for MSA um, in DBS, because clearly the Parkinson's disease targets don't work and cause problems. So uh, it's kind of a twofold goal of one is to diagnose, the other one is to understand the brain circuitry better so that we can come up with an MSA specific treatment, um, surgical type treatment. So that's what I'm recruiting for. And at what point does Botox become? Yeah, so the way that we deliver it in the clinic, um, it's not. So it's, it's just put into the muscles. We don't get it into the bloodstream at all. And the dilution is um, like, one in a hundred thousand. So it's very, very tiny little amount that we use. If it gets into the bloodstream, it's toxic. Or if the actual um, toxin itself gets into a wound, it becomes toxic. But the way that it's delivered um, with, with Botox is one of the brands. Myoblock is another one of the brands where we put it specifically into the muscles in a highly, highly diluted form. Um, it's not been found to be toxic at all. So again, it's, it's all about um, dose and delivery is, is the difference between a poison and a medicine. Uh, how to manage frequent uh, urgency irritation at 95 years old or not at 95 years old? Okay. Uh, do I see a urologist? Yeah, so actually a urologist might help. So if, yeah, so if, if, if you're having a lot of feeling like you need to urinate, but you get there and nothing happens, probably what's happening is the bladder is spasming when it's empty. And so the spasm, the contraction of the bladder is the thing that gives you that, oh my gosh, I have to go feeling. Okay, that gives a signal up to the brain that says get to a bathroom. But if th there's nothing in the bladder, then it contracts. You say you feel like you have to go. It gives you that uncomfortable feeling, but then there's nothing there. So that's often a contraction issue, and there are some medications that can help relax the bladder. But a urologist is the only one who can truly make tell the difference between that, that open bladder that won't contract and the one that's overly contracting. So yeah, I would definitely see a urologist because there are some things that they can do. There was one study looking at actually doing Botox into the bladder of patients like that, um, but I don't know if the results came out to be helpful or not. So I, I'm um, that one I think is still um, they're still looking at the data. They haven't released that yet. Okay, are there more severe autonomic seizures that appear other than urinary and blood uh, dilution? The breathing problem uh, with sleeping that um, that. Uh, um, obstructive sleep apnea with the kind of that really tight um, breathing can is sort of the other one that I get very worried about um, that can cause a lot of, of problems um, and particularly if someone's having that type of breathing during the day um, that can be that can be very worrisome oftentimes uh, BiPAP or CPAP machines that a sleep doctor will um, will fit people for can help with that the preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.